Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, the host, and normally before COVID, we also had Janelle here, but bands were limited in the number of people that can be here. Janelle's taking today off, and with me today is Charlotte P. Rausch. Charlotte is the director of District 5 of the Virginia Daughters of the American Revolution. Welcome, Charlotte. I'm glad that you were able to join us. And number one, I want to ask, what is the DAR today? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Chuck. You're welcome. Um, in a nutshell, the DAR is a non-political, non-profit, volunteer women's service organization with a very straightforward mission for promoting historic preservation, education, and fostering patriotism. The mission hasn't changed for over 130 years. It has had over one million members during that time who can trace their bloodline to someone who supported or fought in the American Revolutionary War. You know, it's, it's amazing the generations as, as you go down, how, how many people will come from one patriot. So, so how has, we've all been, been impacted by COVID, how has COVID impacted the DAR and its mission and everything that? Well, um, COVID actually, um, we've done what we've always done. We've rolled up our sleeves <laughs> and we've got to work. Um, the, um, We just completed over one million masks um, and those and PPE and that went to our first responders, health personnel, schools, teachers, and those on the front lines. The, um, we have filled food banks. We have um, provided food, clothing, baby supplies. We've even provided pet um, food and care supplies. Uh, we've written letters and cards to our senior citizens and um, we've provided medical staff to or provided um, food and meals to our medical staff and our first responders just to say thank you. The um, one of the things to remember about DAR members is that they're so closely connected to their communities. And mm -hmm. as a result, they've developed networks so that we're better able to identify where the needs are and, and where we can support those needs. You know, DAR, I have a number of friends in a couple of chapters, and it's just amazing some of the things that, that they have, have done. It's, you know, certainly I was familiar with the library and, and the, the uh, downtown and some of the chapters, but you know, just the things that they do to help communities to, to survive uh, you know, when there have been things like this, because we've certainly not just had this pandemic, we've had lots of other things. Uh, efforts during wartime and all has just been amazing that, that the groups have pitched in to see what they can do. Well, actually, um, during the First World War, the DAR played a critical role. Mm -hmm. The, um, uh, as many people know, at 70, 1776 D Street, Washington, D.C., is prime real estate. And on, on that space, um, they let the, the federal government use the land to erect a temporary war office. And uh, that office uh, provided space for 600 people. The members showed their patriotism by buying bonds, but they also worked in the hospitals and they supported the Red Cross. And one of our most notable daughters is Jane Delanar, who was the supervisor of the um, U.S. Army's nursing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she also had pulled together those and, and, and with the Red Cross and, and others. And um, they were able to recruit and train 8,000 nurses before the war even started. started. You know, you, you mentioned that they're located at 1776 D Street. For those who may not be familiar, 
It's close to the White House. It's close to the old executive building. It's also close to the Red Cross headquarters downtown D.C. So it really is a prime real estate uh, and, and a really good location there, right in the middle of kind of everything. And we owned and managed that property before we even had the right to vote. Ah, <laughs> yes, and probably some DAR members helped with that effort, I'm, I'm sure. Along well, you the know, way. I wanted to mention something else about World War I, mm -hmm. is that um, the DAR not only did things in the nursing cadre and as well as providing things for the military and, and supporting our government with the purchase of bonds, but it also, after the war, um, raised funds to put in a water system for Tilloloy, France. Ah. And it had a re-chickenized France program <laughs> to rebuild its, its poultry industry. And, and that's where members could purchase an incubated egg for 10 cents or a whole chicken for 25. Okay. And that would go to France to help repopulate the poultry, poultry industry. industry. And ah. its members also um, adopted 3,600 orphans um, who had lost their fathers. Yes during the war, and they, those children stayed in France. France. The funding was to help them stay in France, France. and to help be part of, of the rebuilding of France. And, and that's an important theme for the DAR because it believes in empowerment. Yes, uh, you know, you're mentioning empowerment. What, uh, you know, what would you like to elaborate on, on that There's, as far as empowerment of the DAR members? Well, we do empower our members. Um, the interesting thing about the DAR is that it has um, a fairly defined structure with a lot of opportunities within that. And um, we have members who are lawyers, doctors, executive assistants, people who work from home and raise families. It's, it's everyone. And all of them have an opportunity to work on committees or if they want to pursue leadership roles to do that has some really wonderful training experiences. And it's, I always say it's pursuing your patriotic passions because if you're interested in, in history and preserving history or even um, the fine arts, such as quilting and things like that, there's a role. If you wanna work with schools, there's a terrific role in supporting teachers. And then patriotism. Um, we support the naturalization ceremonies. I'm going to put you on the spot here because you didn't really put that in the background. What's the structure of the DAR from the head on down to local chapters? Just, you know, briefly. What? Well, th well there's a national structure, and um, that's run by a board of management, and um, that has the officers of the DAR, and, and then you have representatives from each of the 50 states as well as um, uh, the Rochambeau and, and the, the Mexico chapters overseas units. And then you have, um, uh, and this is where it's an interesting thing. You have your um, divisions, mm -hmm. which are, are large things, like the Eastern Division would, would encompass a number of states, and that's what, I, what we're in. Um, and those are mainly for coordinating uh, different things like contests and things like that. And then you have your states, um, uh, so you have a state regent for each state, and uh, we're very fortunate that Virginia has Leanne Turbyfill, who's an, who's an incredible state regent, and then she has officers, and then um, we have district directors. There are nine in Virginia because okay. it's a huge state. state. It's almost 10,000 members, and so I'm a district director of District 5. And then you have the chapter regents. And um, we have um, 126 chapters in Virginia and counting. Good. Good. So, um, and then within the chapters, you're going to have officers and you're going to have committee chairs and committees. You know, one, one of the things that amazed me when I, my mother and father's neighbor was, was a member of the DAR, and she started giving me the magazines to read, and there's a lot of interesting articles and all in there, but you know, the national level, you have people all over the country, so you know, a lot of people may think, well, everything is headquartered here in D.C. Well, it is, but the officers and the committee chairs are all over the country, they are. and of course, they come together every 
end of June, beginning of July for Continental Congress. Which, which is, is amazing. Is, you know, I've, I have heard about it, and it is. It just sounds amazing that, that they uh, come there. You know, I think um, I, w I had been a member for a while before I went to Continental Congress, Congress. because I was working. Mm -hmm. And when I finally had a chance to go, it was um, opening night, the flag unfurls across yeah. a Constitution Hall, and I mean, everything is glittering. Yeah. And, um, but the best part is all the daughters you meet from all over the, the country, country and the world for that matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just, just was amazing to me that, that they had, you know, this big organization run by people who lived around the country. The, the, Hey, we're you know, women. We know how to do well, the job yeah, right. That's true. You know, I always thought, well, it's an organization run out of the building at 1776. So, uh, you know, that brings me to a question. Uh, you know, what are the things that we as the public could uh, gain from the DAR? Well, you can, a um, couple of things. One, in communities, you can benefit from the DAR um, because we're there in the schools volunteering. We're volunteering in senior citizen centers with our veterans, everything. Um, the donations we do, the historic preservation work. Um, let me give you an example of some historic preservation work we're doing right now. Okay. And um, we're working with the Fairfax Public School System in, um, in their efforts to digitize, to actually we're actually transcribing and then digitizing records from the school system from um, about 1870 to 1930. Ah. And that includes um, a wealth of records from uh, school minutes, censuses, um, all sorts of things. And we're also writing biographies and we've done 700 so far of um, of uh, school leadership community members and um, uh, and others, and that includes, I believe, now 59 bi biographies of African Americans, oh, wonderful. Um, heavily involved, wonderful. which is really yeah. exciting because there were there's so few, there's so little information on African Americans Americans. during that period of time. Yeah, and and I know myself, I have been involved with things with both the library, and I have also gotten to the the uh, archives, the county archives, not the courthouse archives, but the county archives. And there is so much material there, but it needs organization. It needs, you know, sometimes indexing and all to make it worthwhile and useful to, to people. I want to take and kind of move on to one of my favorite places to go, the DAR library. I adore the DAR library. <laughs> I live in the DAR library. There is nothing that is killing me more right now than not to be there. I, I think that's happening for all of us for all facilities, but I can certainly relate to what you're saying about the library. Yeah, and I, you know, I want to mention that it's, um, it came into being about 1896 with a lot of um, genealogical and historical publications to help um, the, the staff genealogist um, prove uh, the applications for membership, and it grew from there. Um, it's now considered one of the premier genealogical libraries in the world, and uh, it works to continuously acquire and preserve materials related to genealogical research, um, primarily American genealogy and records related to the American Revolution. Um, but well, that's, that's one thing I want to kind of stop you there. People often who are unfamiliar with the library think that it's only related to the American Revolution, mm -mm. and that's not true. No, you know that they they because you're having to prove your your lineage to the Patriots, they're looking for anything, so you can find things from just a few years ago there. Um, you know, 
it's going to be more difficult to find real current stuff because yeah, the primary, but, primarily you know. it's involved in the revolutionary period um, up through like 1850 will be where yeah. most of the primary stuff but is. But they're, they're still gathering things. So I, I want people to understand that they're still gathering things that you know do relate in some cases. Uh, certainly genealogies and things that and people give them. Oh, the that, family histories you know. are amazing. Um, it's got a huge collection of um, family histories and they have over uh, 225,000 books, uh, 10,000 research files, thousands of manuscripts um, and special collections. Yeah, so that, you know, that's, people just say, well, I don't, have a revolutionary person, so I won't go there, and and that's so, you know, wrong to to think that. Uh, you know, I one of the things that we talked about before. I have used the county histories there. They mm -hmm. have one of the best collections. I have found things there that I have not found in research facilities in New Jersey, where half of my family is. And the records are terrific. Um, and I think you and I were talking before the, the show about how you can go in and, and the shelves are organized by state and counties within that and there are just so many vital records involved yeah. and I was fortunate in that there were church records mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I was able to, to use to trace mine and you're right, they're not all going to be people who were involved like in the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War. War and so it's a great resource for family research yeah. and they're, they're a family search affiliate library. Yes, yes, that's, and one of the things too, before, before I forget, it used to be that there was a fee if you were not a DAR or an SAR member, but now it's free. Mm -hmm. So anybody can go in and, and use it. And what I, what I started doing when I first started going down there was I just went across the shelves and I looked at all the books mm -hmm. and I pulled things out and, you know, I wasn't, necessarily specifically looking for something on my family. I just wanted to see what do they have and I just those county histories were just amazing to, to uh, find. I solved the, the problem as we were talking before the show. Uh, I knew my grandparents and great-grandfather uh, great worked for this family down in Vineland but I had no idea that they were related. And I found that because of a book that I found on the shelves at the DAR library mm -hmm. that I have looked for in the New Jersey State Library and a number of other genealogical uh, libraries, even Vineland where this family was from, and they don't have a copy of it. If I hadn't gone there, I ne well, I probably eventually would have found the answer. But it was so much easier just connecting the family that we were actually related. And the, the nice thing is um, they also have incredibly knowledgeable people there. Yes. And they offer a terrific um, uh, lecture series. Oh, do they? I didn't know. On did. genealogy. Yeah. And um, those are also available as, as webinars. Okay. If you go to the DAR um, website Site. and you go into the library programs, and um, right now they, they've got a number of them. There's some, they focus on different types of um, records, but they're also doing them on each of the, um, the 13 colonies. Yes, I, I knew that, that they um, were working on that. And of course, I looked at the information you sent. They still haven't done New Jersey yet. <laughs> well, they have It's one of four that they're working on, I believe. Well, that's on the guides. Okay. The, the research guides, which are, which are incredible. Um, but I, I do believe they did a webinar in New Jersey. Oh, okay, yeah. And um, that one I thought was fascinating because of the changes that New Jersey went through and how it, the shape, the forms of the counties changed and things like yes. that and, and the implications for finding your ancestors. Yeah, and, and of course, I've, I've also used the Pennsylvania collection uh, but, un well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, most of my family is 1880s immigrants into Philadelphia. So, but I have used, used the collection for one of my lines in Pennsylvania. So, so there is so much down there. Uh, could you talk about the Symes 
microfilm collection? Well, the Symes microfilm, uh, microfilm collection um, has um, about 53,000 items on microfilm. And um, that's mainly focused on federal and state records of the Revolutionary War and court records from the states. And um, so that's been a, a real asset for people. Um, and those things aren't always published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been a huge help. And then, um, as I mentioned before, the Family Search um, microfilm is available as well um, with what you can get through as an affiliate library, right. and that's been very helpful. And, and just, I don't know whether all of our viewers will know, uh, with the structure of the, the Family History Library, you have the library in Salt Lake, and then you have the Family History Centers where you can go and use the computers and the other things that are there, and each one of them is set up slightly different because it depends on who is in charge, what they may focus on, but also there are facilities that some of the records you can go on to Family Search and you can actually click and look at the records. And some of them are restricted because of the agreement between the Family History Library and the, whoever owns the records of whether they don't want everything out there like we just go to the internet and, and click on them. And so you have to have either a family history center or an affiliate. We're fortunate here in Northern Virginia, we have a number of them, but also being able to go to the DAR, you know, you can also look at these records. Also Mount Vernon, I don't know whether they've completed the paperwork yet or not, but they are working on becoming an affiliate too. So it gives you more options to be able to look at things. And with the DAR library, if you find something there, you can maybe end up going to the collection and you know, move further in your research. You don't have to go home and go to another place. So that's a real asset to, to your collection. I, you know, looking at it from a user, that's just a fantastic asset to have. Well, it, it is. It's, there are so many tools available to you. There are ways of learning about genealogy. There are ways of pursuing it. I, when I do one of the, the lectures, I'll go into D.C. for the lecture, and, and then I hit the library immediately to apply it. <laughs> um, and um, the thing I like, too, is if you want to make a copy of a page or something, you can bring your thumb drive. Mm-hmm. And, and put it on a thumb drive. You just have to be careful that you're not abusing any of the copyright um, uh, laws or anything like that, but it makes your research a little easier. Right, and, and of course one of the things too that, that we kind of touched on that I have, have found helpful, particularly for some clients, is people will often years ago type up family genealogies Mm -hmm. and donate a copy. Another place is the Library of Congress. And you know, those are kind of manuscript kinds of things that are going to be very unique to just a few places. Mm -hmm. And I was working with, with one person that they knew there was a family genealogy. They knew that it was at the Library of Congress, but I was having problems getting it there and I happened to be at DAR for something else, and I looked it up and they had a copy. And I could go right over, pull it off the shelf and use it as I needed to, where I had to order it and have it brought from the stacks at the Library of Congress. So that made it, made it uh, a little bit more difficult. Well, you know what's nice too, and, and something you can do and as you prepare to go to the DAR library is, is if you go to their genealogy tab on the, uh, the website, and it's dar.org, and you go to the genealogy, and you can go to the catalog, and, mm -hmm. and you can find out what's been in there. And, and daughters work very hard at indexing. Yes. A lot of yes. information, even Bibles have been indexed yes, and, that's, and everything. That's one of the projects I know they were doing. And what was great about that was if your family Bible traveled across the country, even though say they were here in Virginia, the family Bible might end up out in Oregon, but you have no 
way of knowing mm -hmm. that they went in and copied that information out of the Bibles and typed it up and, and turned it into books that are in various libraries. And I have found that in New Jersey, there are a few things that they don't have downtown that are in facilities that chapters had done. One other thing we're getting close on time I wanted to ask was, okay, say your ancestor was a DAR member. Mm -hmm. Can you find out about that? Can you find out how she got in? Well, uh, yes, you can. You can um, go again to the genealogy and you can look at the descendants or the ancestors database and that will include the applications. Sure. It will not show certain recent generations sure. for privacy um, reasons, um, but you will be able to look at um, the applications and the line that it, it followed. And then you can show where you're related to the nearest person you're related mm -hmm. to, to for your membership. Which is, which is quite helpful if you're, you're trying to get back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I wish one of my ancestors was a DAR member along the line, but I have, I have kind of looked and I haven't found any, anyone, particularly as we were talking my Bucks County, Pennsylvania problem. If, if only one of them had been a DAR member, that might have been helpful. So. Well, Charla, I really appreciate your coming in and sharing with our viewers this wonder facility that, that we have downtown and also the great work of the members of the DAR chapters. And you know, I know that, that they have benefited so many people over time and particularly in this crisis we're going through now, being able to to assist the first responders and everybody else that they have been able to help. So uh, I want to put the little plug in for Janelle for the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, our sponsor. We meet the third Tuesday of the month. We are still on Zoom. If you are not a member, you can still sign up and view the programs and once we open hope that you will join us, and we also have a small but very packed library for you to come in and do research in.